Hello, and welcome back to Sociology 101. As you can see, we have a guest with us today. In fact, I can say our most popular guest here at Sociology 101 by far has been Dr. Ken Wilson. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Wilson. Thank you, Leighton. Great to be here with you. Well, besides uh, being an orthopedic hand surgeon, uh, knowing fluently multiple languages and uh, teaching course full-time there as a professor at Th uh, Grace School of Theology, I know you are also an accomplished author um, who's wrote his doctoral dissertation on Augustine's conversion from traditional free choice to non-free free will, a comprehensive methodology, which by the way, I have sitting here right next to me um, and uh, have several pages marked. I also have, of course, the, the, the summary version of that, the foundation of Augustinian Calvinism, um, which is a, a summary um, of, of that. And I want to put it up on, on the screen because I wanted our audience to see this there at uh, uh, Amazon. Many of you have already purchased this. Our, our listeners uh, are well aware of this book. And I, the reason I know that is because if you scroll right down here, Dr. Wilson, um, right here, frequently bought together, the Potter's Promise and God's Provision for All, often bought with the foundation of Augustinian Calvinism. And uh, and I, I love uh, that my books are next to an Oxford scholars book. That makes me feel really good. Uh, just, I just have to brag a little bit about that. So that's, that's, that's my claim to fame there. But uh, for those that don't remember the reason that the, the, uh, the, the foundation of Augustinian Calvinism was produced by Ken Wilson was uh, at my humble request. Um, I, I, I had this and as I was reading through it, I thought to myself, there is just way too much valuable information in this book uh, for the average layman not to have uh, access to it. And that's exactly why the foundation for uh, of Augustinian Calvinism was produced, was to kind of give a summary version of this larger work from his doctoral work there at Oxford uh, that the average layman could pick up, could afford, and, and you know, very, very inexpensively there for $15 or even $8 there on Kindle. Um, and, and, and be able to have access to a lot of this information. And, and as you can see there, there are uh, mostly uh, five-star reviews. Over 90% of them are four-star and above. So um, most of the author, most of the uh, uh, people who've purchased this book do obviously like it. But with every book, there's all, obviously the negative reviews. There's going to be those who don't like it as much and obviously bias and those kinds of things. Um, which you expect that. I mean, I, I have several of them on my book as well. Um, and both of my books, I have people who obviously disagree with me, but there, there's a difference between being dis disagreeing with somebody and just being completely malicious in your attacks of them. Uh, and so we're, we're going to actually look at some of these reviews. And I wanted to give Ken Wilson an opportunity to, to reply to some of the quote unquote reviews or maybe just um, rants, you might call them <laughs> regardless of, uh, of the, the source of them. But before we did that, I thought we'd be at least charitable and fair and, and, and look at some of the, uh, the, the positive ones first. As you can see, there's the, the positive and the negatives right next to each other, critical reviews versus the, the, uh, the, the more positive ones. And I think uh, Glenn there, Shellrude, Glenn does a pretty good job. Matter of fact, his, his, this is the highest rated review because he just walks through every part of your book and gives uh, kind of a, an overview of everything, um, pointing out, for example, for example, point one, determinism was widely known in the ancient world, Stoicism, Neoplatonism, um, Gnosticism, Manichaeanism. Augustine had been deeply shaped by Stoic, uh, Stoicism, Neoplatonism, and there had been a, a, had been a part of Manichaean tradition for 10 years before his conversion. Um, you, he points out no Christian theologian um, from... 80, 95 to 411 embraced determinism and many argued against it as a pagan heretical perspective. And he he, make, he goes on to make several other key points from your book. And so uh, again, 94 people considered that to be uh, the most helpful uh, review of your book. And I thought it was a, a good one as well. And look at there, there's some guy named Layton, uh, whoever that is. Uh, <laughs> um, my, my review back when I first got the book and, and I wrote this, I said, Dr. Wilson is the foremost scholar on Augustinianism in the world today. And this summary of his Oxford dissertation, especially produced for readers at all levels of study, clearly reveals how and why theistic determinism, sometimes referred to as Reformed or Calvinistic theology, came to be so influential within the Western church. Everyone needs to be aware of the historical facts surrounding these matters in order to make an educated decision regarding the truth and the validity of sociological doctrines in question. And there are way too many uh, 
really great reviews for us to read, but there's really some really good insights in some of these reviews if you go through there at Amazon and read through those. And I encourage you to do that. And for our listeners, if you haven't left a review yet, you've got this book, um, go do that. That helps counterbalance um, some of the <laughs> the more angry Calvinists out there who want to just leave one star reviews and, and rant. Um, but but I, I think it's important for us to, to kind of go through this because, I, you know, when, when people ask questions, I want us to be honest about our replies to them and, and to answer them. Um, but I also want to say this, one of the reasons I, I asked Dr. Wilson to come back on was because of this, this letter I got. Uh, I got this probably eight months ago or more. It was back during, it seemed like, it seemed like it was during the middle of COVID, I believe. And I kind of filed it away. Um, and I was reminded of it when I got another email um, of somebody asking me to respond to this particular critique the most popular uh, negative critique there on Amazon. And it reminded me of this letter. And so I wanted to put this letter in here to show you one of the reasons I wanted Dr. Wilson to come back on and maybe as a, an admonition for uh, people who write on Amazon to be careful. You may be apologizing later for what you've written uh, in, in previous times. And this is exactly what this particular uh Former Calvinist, I may call him that, former Calvinist uh, did in writing me. He, he wrote this, and I didn't get his permission to publish his name, so I won't do that. But um, he writes this. He says, Dr. Flowers, I'm just writing to apologize. I know you probably don't know who I am, but I was one of the first people to write a negative review on your book, The Potter's Promise. To be honest, I had only thumbed through the book to find your commentary on a particular verse in Romans 9 that did not align with my thinking, and I immediately fired off a one-star negative rant against your entire book. That was unfair and uncharitable, and I sincerely apologize. I have deleted that review and replaced it with a more positive and hopefully insightful feedback after reading the book in its entirety. Over the last year and a half since getting your book, I have reluctantly listened to a few of your podcasts in an effort to defeat your concepts and ideas. But to be honest, I found myself questioning some of my foundational beliefs. I can't say I'm 100% on board with your views, but I will admit that some of your arguments and your interpretations make much more sense of the text than what I had previously thought. I'm still praying and searching through the scripture to better understand God's truth. I also wanted to encourage you to have Ken Wilson back on your program because some of the points he made regarding the earliest writings of the church were a catalyst in leading me to question some of my foundational beliefs. I would love to hear more from him and possibly his answers to some of the critics out there who are bashing his work. I'm not trying to stir up controversy, but I, ha but I have honest questions about who to believe when it comes to the scholarship of the writings in the early church. Thank you for your time and for your work you have done. May God bless you and your efforts. I thought that was just a great um, letter to kind of introduce this back and forth and maybe this yeah. particular uh, episode. And so before we kind of jumped into this, Dr. Wilson, what has been your feedback from the writing of not only the Foundation of Augustinian Calvinism, your original dissertation? Um, have you had much up, much more stir up about this or defending of the, the particular views that you hold to with uh, people bringing critique? Well, the academic world continues to to look at it. There was a review in the uh, American Academy of Religion. Uh, Reading Religion is the journal which summarizes those and very positive review by a scholar. Uh, she had nice things to say about it, uh, like I say, just a few weeks ago. So it's still receiving good reviews. The, the, uh, <laughs> the bad reviews, um, and there are a couple, uh, are from uh, a Catholic uh, librarian. Uh, and she's, uh, I mean, so, <laughs> so biased, it's not funny. And then there is an uh, Augustinian uh, um, monk, Catholic, from Germany. Um, you have to read German to, to read the review, but he, he wasn't real happy with it either uh, as a Catholic uh, Augustinian monk. So um, the people who are open and not uh, already very biased are giving very good reviews in the academic world. Um, okay. Well, um, I, I know some of the, the things we're going to look at today when you talk about Amazon reviews or critiques on Amazon, obviously not peer reviewed, um, not held to uh, account by any kind of a publisher uh, like your work had to go through, yeah. um, which is unfortunate to some degree when you really think about it, because um, I, I know free speech is important and I think we should have free speech. We should have the ability to express our opinions about things. But as Christians, I would ho hope that we would hold ourselves to some kind of a standard of honesty and integrity when representing our brothers and sisters in Christ, even if we may disagree with their findings. 
Um, and and the particular uh, review that we're going to look to, look to, look at today, I, I hesitate to I hesitated to even bring it uh, to 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 give it a stage, so to speak, because it is um, just bad. It, it, it's it's just um, not not a good review. Uh, many of these are like that, and they're obviously just biased. Uh, let me give you some examples. Um, not that you, <laughs> not, not, not not that you would like to see bad, exa- bad, bad examples of people calling you names and stuff. But uh, called the, you're called first of all the cherry picker, uh, which I assume is a is a, a slam that you're just picking out the things that help your case. Uh, and he he writes he writes this: um, when you enter an endeavor with an inflexible presupposition and the end already guaranteed, you can expect nothing else than what you find here. Wilson cherry picks what he needs to support his immutable thesis. Even going so far as to make the early church fathers necessarily say what he needs them to say to support his ultimate goal of making Augustine out to be a heretic, his words repeatedly. Why? Because in Wilson's dogged, undeterred evaluation of man and his God, little g-God, free will, his will to say and to twist whatever he needs to in order to preserve his idol, um, even if it means painting Pelagius as a mistreated and misunderstood as well as Erasmus as orthodox, thus you can connect the dots. If Augustine became heretical, then Calvin did too. And that means all Calvinist reforms uh, reformers thereafter. Wow. Wilson subsequently only proves the point that man at his core, rebellious since the fall, will never give God the rightful glory due to his name. By his decree, mind you, just keep in mind that God's decreed for all us free will idol worshipers to do this. Just keep that in mind behind the scenes, okay? But nevertheless, free will in the main reign, supreme God, is a handcuffed by pesky free will. As with all Pelagians, man is exalted and God is belittled. Lord have mercy. <laughs> well, Dr. Wilson, do you, have, you, you want to say anything about that? Yeah, well, um, surf, it's not a book review. It's a opinion piece, ranting, as, as you say. Um so this book, I think I've shown this before, haven't I, um, on your program, this uh, myth of Pelagianism. Um, I actually had Ali Bonner, Dr. Bonner was on the program just about a month ago. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, great scholar. Uh, I met her personally at the Oxford Patristics Conference, International Conference every year. And uh, this book um, actually won uh, the award uh, from the British Academy. Uh, and published by Oxford University Press. So I'm not the only one saying Pelagius was mistreated and uh, there was a problem there. Um, <laughs> that's uh, that's a pretty common knowledge now. So, and you look at his other stuff and it's like, is this guy talking about himself or me? Um, wow, uh, talk about somebody who's got an opinion and biased. He doesn't <laughs> mention any facts whatsoever. There are no facts in that whole thing. Uh, he's just ranting. And yet I have the facts lined up. So if he could show me where I'm wrong on the facts, then maybe he'd have something on which to stand. But there's nothing there. I mean, how can you argue against something when there's nothing but just opinion there and no facts? I don't have anything I run, to say. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I run into this quite regularly. It's it, the broad brushed blanket accusations. Uh, Leighton, you don't understand Calvinism. Leighton, um, you've misrepresented Calvinism. But then, then I'll just ask for specifics, okay? What did I say in specific that is a misrepresentation of all forms of Catholic uh, or Calvinistic thought? Because Calvinism is not monolithic. There are different kinds of Calvinists. Um, can, can you just give me an example of something I've said that is misaligning Calvinism altogether? Uh, was I making a logical implication of the claims of Calvinism? It w- was Is that clearly my point? Or was I, was I misquoting Calvin or uh, a leading Calvinist source? Um, give me some specifics. And usually it's crickets after that. Usually there's nothing there yeah. because they don't have anything more to say than just a blanket accusation. And again, that happens both ways. Um, that's not just Calvinists doing that to us. I see uh, I, I see those on our side do that to Calvinists sometimes too. And it's just as wrong regardless of who does it. But it, it's especially something that it seems like it's happening more and more from Calvinists uh, towards our side because Calvinists have the bigger platform uh, and, and the Calvinists are the ones who can kind of controlling the narrative online. And yeah. so uh, maybe it seems like it's overwhelmingly uh, one one sided because of the fact that many of the Calvinists are uh, are controlling the narrative when it, when it comes to that. Um, let me let me give you a few more examples, um, not to beat beat the, the horse here, but I, I just I think uh, it, it's just good to see some of these things so that you can have a chance to at least respond to them. And I, and I think you're going to find the same kind of of 
rhetoric. Uh, this book is very difficult to read on that level. Um, merit more than three stars. I get it. It was sort of thrown together as a more accessible form of a doctoral work, but my goodness, the man needs an editor for both clarity of writing and editing and formatting errors throughout. My, 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 my comment to this, I, I'll, I'll handle this one for you, Dr. Wilson. Um, read through the other reviews. Almost every single one of them says how clear and accessible and easy it is to follow and understand because it was made for the layman. And so you, you hold up this one, it says it's not clear with the thousand others that say it's very clear. I, I exaggerate hundreds of others that say it's very clear. And um, obviously you, you have a peer review work uh, that's reviewed by scholars, the leading, leading scholars in the field. Who's reviewing this guy's work? Nobody. He just posts it online and pushes a uh, return and it's there for everybody to read and to see. Do uh, you want to even uh, respond to that at all? <laughs> you don't have uh, to. Well, <laughs> it's well, really not <laughs> worth your time. It, it could be. I, I did have an editor that helped me dumb down the, uh, <laughs> I hate to say it that way, but yeah, take the massive thesis and bring it down to a lower level. And it was an attorney and, and she's a friend. So that's probably why it may not be quite as good as an attorney helped me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're blaming, you're blaming lawyers. Is that what you're doing? That's right. Uh, so she, she works in Washington, D.C. Uh, there, but uh, she, she helped a lot. And uh, I, I think it's still pretty clear. I mean, I, I was... I was glad she did it. So uh, anything yeah. that's left is obviously my fault. But uh, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, what can I say? Uh, yeah, great. I hear you. I hear you. All right. Um, yeah, it, th this guy calls it a hit piece uh, against Augustine. Um, no more accurate than uh, the history than Dan Brown and currently authoring a book response to this awful. So he he is he's saying he's authoring a book. So Kevin Hughes. Um, is authoring a book. This was written back in February of 2020. I, I don't know of a book by Ken Hughes, uh, but maybe it's still in works. I don't know. But he's, he's saying he's authoring a book in response uh, to thoroughly refute this nonsense made by this author. You, usually when you're throwing out words like nonsense, complete, and just, just exasperated types of tones, um, you're obviously not offering a, any kind of a bias, um, objective review. You're just yeah, ranting. Yeah. Um, at that point. And so uh, yeah. probably not worth, worth time even going over that. Um, well, and this a, guy, yeah, go ahead. That's a really good point, Leighton, because if you read a, a, a scholarly book review, it basically goes through and shows what's the author's main points, what are the positives, what are the negatives. And it's easy to tell a biased review by somebody who's, you know, emotional about it and not thinking. And that is, there's nothing good. That There's no good statement about anything in there. And when you see that, you can just take a big X and X off that review. So this person's biased. They're not giving a valid review. Uh, very easy. Yeah, to which it's pretty much all of these are that way. I don't, I don't think there is any of them uh, here, here, uh, Caleb Mullins, which, which by the way, I respect the people who actually put their name on there because several of them don't do that. <laughs> several of them just give a false name or don't put their name at all. But this guy is actually putting his name right there with the review. Uh, Leighton Flowers and his followers have promoted this book ad nauseum, claiming that Ken Wilson is a leading authority on Augustine, uh, uh, St. Augustine of Hippo and ch early church, uh, church history. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. Being a lover of church history myself, I was absolutely appalled at Wilson's historic claims. This book is one of the absolute worst pieces of theology and, and history ever penned. Again, just dramatic types of statements without absolutely no... Uh, reflection, um, like you said, actually pointing out the, the points of the book and the, the positives and negatives, those kinds of things, uh, refers to it is intellectually lazy. Yeah, Oxford's just always producing intellectually lazy material. That's just, that's the, um, the <laughs> it's just, it's, it's uh, Wilson received his PhD in theology from Oxford University. The very research which comprises this book, the professors, here, here here's your chance here, the professors on his doctoral committee who awarding him this degree ought to be thoroughly ashamed of themselves as academics and should be fired. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's just, I mean, you don't even have to, things like this, you don't even have to really respond to. It's just, and this this one, he, this one's calling it fiction, those kinds of things. And so you're going to get these kinds of, of uh, reviews, but to a serious review, somebody who actually brings uh, any kind of level of critique that's worth mentioning. Um, uh, very likely one of these these folks is probably going to write you someday in the future and say, much like that that gentleman said to me, hey, sorry, I may have overreacted. 
Um, I, I may have overstated my case there, but uh, the one that that took the cake that's the most um, the liked, I guess, of the negative critiques. Uh, and the one, if any of them actually brings in quotes from early church writings, it's this one from Thuan Tran. I think it's a Vietnamese individual. I think it's the same one that used to post on Sociology 101 just ad nauseum to the point where he had to be deleted because of his uh, uh, rancor uh, and rhetoric on our on our uh, website. I think it's the same gentleman. I'm not sure of that, but I, I think it, I recognize that name, Tran. Um but he does at least cite some sources to try to back up what he's saying. And this was the one, the review that was sent to me on the email just a couple of weeks ago, asking for, for me to have you on to review this. And that's what reminded me of that previous email that I'd gotten from that other gentleman. And so that's why I asked you to come on. So forgive me for, for abusing you in this way, Dr. Wilson. I know you have surgeries and all the kinds of fun stuff to, to that you could be doing that's better, but I thought this would be fun for our audience to at least be able to see you kind of walk through because I always would like to be a fly on the wall sometimes when you're reading these reviews and kind of what you're thinking when you're reading them. Like, okay, what would, what would Ken Wilson say to uh, some of these quotes and some of these things that he's saying? And so uh, you want us to walk us through this? I can, I can read parts of it and uh, go through it or what, what, what would you like to say about this particular one? Uh, sure. So first of all, I, I have never seen uh Twain, trans name on any academic journal. Uh, I have no idea who he is. Um, uh, that doesn't seem to be um, somebody who's educated in patristics. Uh, so, I mean, you have to start there. And, and these people that are writing this are not educated in patristics. Um, <clears throat> I would also say, and I think we pointed out this before, that that book was published by Boris Seebeck. I mean, that's one of the most highly respected academic theological journals you know, uh, that they do in that uh, series in which they published it. So, I mean, you're going to be, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, spitting into the wind if you're trying to say that this is not academically credible. Um, the scholars have recognized that. Uh, so you've got non-scholars trying to say it isn't, and, and it's certainly from a bias. Um, uh, I did read, uh, when you pointed that out to me, all of trans entire 50, almost 50 paragraphs, I think. So at least he's not lazy. Uh, he's tried to do some research. I mean, that's good. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. But it looks like he could use some formal education at a reputable university in patristics. <clears throat> and the reason is he commits numerous sophomoric errors. Uh, no scholar would, would do such a thing. So um, I guess Another thing I really ought to say, this this is a fake review. Uh, it's not a theological review. Uh, you could not publish this in a theological journal, as you pointed out. That requires peer review, and no journal would have, would publish this opinion piece. So I, we'll, we'll just start there, and you can ask me you go specifics. Okay. Well, here's, here's what he writes. He says, here's an example of Wilson omitting a lot of evidence that would have refuted his claims of Augustine bringing in novelties out of supposed Gnosticism. Quotes, all of them prior to, quotes, all of them prior to Augustine, affirming infant baptismal salvation to forgive sins of infants as a result of original sin. So guess what he's first doing is, is not really hitting the main point of the free will argument. He's actually hitting a sub point, I guess, uh, regarding baptismal regeneration of infants is is that the what you're understanding yes and you know he's missed the major point of the book uh and that nobody ever said i did not ever say that augustine was the first <clears throat> to say you should baptize infants to forgive sins uh, that is not uh, that is not true i never said that what i said was in the context read the context is that Augustine was the first to say we need to baptize infants because if we don't, they go to hell because of Adam's inherited guilt. He's the first one to ever say that. And I've read through all of the early church fathers. You cannot find it anywhere else. So were they baptizing infants? Absolutely. Uh, were they baptizing them for salvation? Well, that's that's a difficult question to really answer uh, until you get to Augustine. Um, but the most important thing is if you look at Tertullian, 
who wrote, you know, 210, 220, what did he say? He said, why are we baptizing infants? Why don't we wait until they can make a decision for Christ themselves and believe? Um, I mean, I've got the quote if we want to read it. Uh, he's the first one to write on it. And he says, don't do it. <laughs> wait until they can yeah. have faith. So that's a pretty um, awkward thing for people who believe in infant baptism as the apostolic secession to try to deal with this great church father who, who says such a thing. And, and I'm a Baptist, so we've always immersed, uh, you know, adults um, or at least people of age. Um, so I, I'm not real familiar with paleo, paleo baptism and the, the history behind it. Um, so those that have studied that and know more about it, you probably can say more. But I have Methodist friends and others that baptize infants, and, and many of them have described it not as salvific, but as more of a dedication of the child, as a promise to God, as a symbol of of. Uh, you know, dedicating them to God in much of the same way that Baptist would be baby dedication and those kinds of things, and that it's not a salvific act um, necessarily right. or washing away of their original sin or something like that. So I know at least in modern day, there are people who baptize infants that don't believe in baptismal regeneration and the washing away of original guilt inherited by Adam. So I would assume that that's possible uh, to be a belief right. held in the early church as well. Um, I, I, I obviously don't know because I haven't studied the subject. Well, that's exactly right. When I was at Oxford, we went to a Church of England there that was an evangelical church, and they baptized infants. Uh, that was the tradition. Uh, they didn't think it was salvific. Uh, you weren't, uh, the infant was not uh, justified by that salvation. They did not receive the Holy Spirit at that point. It was not baptismal regeneration, just like you said. So they're practicing that now in England. Um, yeah. So I mean, why not think that that was the same thing that happened uh, at that point? Um, I even in my book point out that uh, probably infant baptism began with the Jews. Um, I talked to an Augustinian scholar at the Patristics Conference, and he said, you need to write an article on that because that's probably accurate. Um, and, and it's in the book. I mean, I won't bore your readers with how that all started. But, uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty neat to, to find out, hey, this is a likely way that infant baptism started around 200 in North Africa. Uh, and I remember you, it seems like you told us this story, if I remember correctly, that Augustine tells some story about um, a, a woman um, having a baby and trying to get to the baptismal waters and failing or something of that nature. Do you, can you recount that story that you, uh, that you told us, I think, in previous times? Sure. So, so Augustine comes to the conclusion, uh, because of his stoicism, that God micromanages every aspect of the world that God decides which babies are baptized and go to heaven and which babies are not baptized and go to hell, that he is he's doing double predestination here, if you want to use that term. Um, and the story is that there is a, uh, a Christian couple whose infant child is dying and they rush it to the baptismal font for the, for the bishop to baptize, and yet the baby dies before they get through the door and into the water. So that baby goes to hell versus a prostitute who abandons a child on the street, a virgin of the church picks up that child, rushes it to the baptismal font, the baby's baptized and goes to heaven. Therefore, it has nothing to do with free will. It's whoever God chooses, because God chose the prostitute's baby to go to heaven and blocked the Christian's baby from going to heaven, and that child must go to hell because the damnation of, of Adam's inherited guilt. That's his own example. Okay. So it seems to me um, Tran's work here of providing all these quotes are providing quotes against something you never claimed um, yeah. and, and taking it further than what you were making the claim. You were in context talking about original guilt and inheriting the guilt of Adam um, and therefore a baby going to hell if he dies before he gets to the baptismal waters that you, you saw that as initially the first claim made more by uh, made by Augustine, not by other early church fathers. And so all these quotes about infant baptism that he provides really aren't hitting your actual point of contention or the point you were you were bringing up. Is that correct? Th that's exactly right. I mean, the the whole idea that infants were baptized is not new. Everybody knows that. If you read uh, Everett Ferguson's early baptism in the early church, he goes through all those and very nicely uh, does a good job. But you, you cannot find anywhere where it says that you're baptizing that baby to forgive the inherited guilt of Adam. And if you don't baptize the infant, 
that infant goes to hell. Nobody it dares make that statement in the early church because they don't believe it. It's not there. Well, many many Calvinists like John Piper and MacArthur don't make that statement even today. I mean, yeah. most of them, even though their doctrines, their the claims of their doctrines would seem to fit that way of thinking, um, on the basis of you know the the concept of inherited guilt and and deadness, spiritual deadness from birth, that even an unborn baby would have this inherited guilt apparently that somehow and 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 Piper uh, speculates that maybe there's some kind of a, uh, you know, um, re uh, sanctification, you know, p uh, after death or something of that nature that can happen or whatever. But it seems like both of them and Sproul, I think even argues if I, if I remember correctly, that, that babies do not end up going to hell. Um, and so to, to suggest that the early church fathers unanimously believed that any baby, a baby that was born or that was, you know, stillborn, or that any baby that died before they got to the baptismal waters went to hell. That that's a pretty extreme position, and you're saying Augustine is the first to really promote that kind of concept, and that's what you were you were pushing back against, so to speak, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely, uh, no question. He's the first. Nobody else does it, and uh, he tries to get around it himself, just like these other uh, modern Calvinist Reformed people do. Uh, but it's very difficult to get around. I mean, if you believe that you're born to, with inherited guilt and damnation from Adam, then you got to do something with that. And if you can't do it by faith, which is the only way we know of to do it, unless you're Catholic and you can say, well, that's the baptismal waters that do it, um, you're in trouble. Um, Augustine right. recognized he was in trouble. I guess the modern guys don't realize that they're in trouble. <laughs> Their theology yeah. doesn't make sense. Uh, yeah, well said. Um now, let me let me let me broach another topic with you. Um, it, it seems to me some of the comments that are being made about your work treat it as if it's brand new or that it's uh, idiosyncratic. It's like it's just yours. Like you came up with this, um, and that that's not true. You're you're the first on record that I'm aware of who've read Augustine's work in order, as he told us to. <laughs> um, all of his works in order. And you're the first one to therefore come to conclusions based upon that research, but you're not the first one, correct me if I'm wrong, you're not the first one to conclude that Augustine was the one who introduced uh, these more deterministic findings into the church writings uh, in, in, in the uh, fifth century, early fifth century. Is that correct? Right. Um... If you if you look at the scholars and, and what I quote in my uh, doctoral thesis uh, there, uh, published by Moore Seebeck, I quote all kinds of people saying how Augustine was very uh, stoic in his thinking. Augustine was a Gnostic Manichaean. He, he had picked up that idea. Uh, Neoplatonism. I mean, some of the greatest scholars say that he was more, you know, platonic than uh, Origen himself, which is supposed to be the, you know, the, the early church father who's so Neoplatonic um, into Neoplatonism. So I'm not the first one to say the, the, or the, there are these problems with Augustine's theology and his thinking. Um, what I did was say, and then only, I mean, the expert um, on Augustine, um, and, and I, I'm not sure I'm the foremost Augustinian scholar laden. I appreciate that, but I, I, I wouldn't go that far. Um, uh, uh, the guy who is probably recognized as the Alan Fitzgerald uh, said he'd only, when I talked to him personally, he only knows five people that have ever read Augustine all the way through. Um, uh, and, and only one that I know that read it chronologically. And he wasn't looking for what I was trying to find. And that is, when, why, and where did Augustine change from traditional free will theology into this non-free free will stoic idea? And it's very clear when you read it chronologically what happened. So I'm not, I'm not coming up with any great novel new things um, about it uh, other than saying, well, this is when it happened with the Manichaean, the Gnostic, <clears throat> the uh, Stoic, and the Neoplatonic ideas. This is where they all came together, and this is what came out the other side. This is when it happened and why it happened. Um, that's a big deal, but I'm not coming up with anything novel as far as him being influenced by all these people. I'm... 
Well, and some people may not know this, but back when I first was introduced to you, um, I had my I had my reservations. In other words, I, I didn't know who you were. I didn't know a lot about you. Um, I get contacted by different people or I, I, I find different people's work that I end up researching and finding some hesitation as to whether I want to have them on the program. So I do research people to try to find out a little bit more. And when I saw some of the claims you were making, I began to order some of the books from people who know what they're talking about. For example, I got this book, Johannes Van Ort, um, who makes the exact same claims that you do with regard to Augustine's uh, tie to Manichaeanism and his Manichaeanism uh, obviously influencing his Christianity unapologetically, even uh, even saying that it, it seems to me that that it, it was seen more as a, uh, a, a combination of the two he describes yeah. um, as, as making it better. In other words, it's, it almost describes it as Augustine saw this as improving upon Christianity to bring in these ideas unapologetically. At least that's the way Ort kind of describes it in one of his chapters. And so I, I just pull up pull up him because I know that you you I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with Ort's work because he's he's uh, pretty extensive writing on this subject as well. Correct. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Van Ort's one of the experts on Manichaeanism and Augustine. Uh, I quote him extensively uh, in my thesis because he is telling exactly as it is. Um, <laughs> Guy Strumsa, another expert on Manichaeism, I quote him. I mean, there, there are plenty of people who understand how Augustine, not in his early stages, in early stages he was fighting against Manichaeism, but when he came to Pelagius, then he started picking up those ideas and using them to fight Pelagius. So, uh, yeah, Van Ort's a very, uh, very highly respected scholar in this field as is Strumsa. So I'm, I mean, good. I, I'm not making this up, but the people have written this. Well, not only have other people written this that are scholars who may be unbiased in this, in, the, in their writings, but people who theologically are reformed Calvinists have also come to very similar conclusions, which those who are listeners have heard these quotes dozens of times. So forgive me, our regular listeners, but some people I know are going to just tune in because they see Ken Wilson's face on the thumbnail here. Um, but let me just put this up there. Um, these are two professors at the Covenant Theological Seminary wrote a book, Why I'm Not an Arminian. So these guys are obviously on the Calvinistic side of things, if you haven't picked that up, okay? They write this, the semi-Pelagians, which we would, of course, have uh, issue with that particular label, but nevertheless, that's what they call us. The semi-Pelagians were convinced that Augustine's monergistic emphasis upon salvation by grace alone represented a significant departure from the traditional teaching of the church. And a survey of the thought of the ap apostolic fathers shows that argument is valid. In comparison to Augustine's monergistic doctrine of grace, the teachings of the apostolic fathers tended toward a synergistic view of redemption. In other words, what do these Calvinistic scholars find in their research of the early church fathers? That Augustine has a significant departure from the traditional teaching of the church. That's not unique to Ken Wilson at all. And the, when people on Twitter and on Amazon reviews and all these kinds of places make it sound like Ken Wilson is, is this breaking new revelation that Augustine is the first one to depart from the traditional view of the church. I'm just like going, are you, are you people not listening to even your own scholars? <laughs> it's so obvious. Do you want to comment on that? Well, that's exactly right. And they're not the only ones that understand that. Um, numerous scholars uh, in the reform field have, have pointed that out. Um, and I, again, I cite them in the, in the foundation of Augustinian Calvinism. Um, so, yeah, I, I think people get so blinded by their own tradition that they can't hear anything negative and they just react instead of actually reading. Um, reading is a lost art. Studying, uh, being scholarly is a lost art. I mean, you, you know, in, in evangelical circles especially, I mean, I'm just going to be honest. Uh, they don't want to read it. They just want to, well, this is what it means to me, and uh, this is right, and I'm going to bash you because you don't agree with me. Um, yeah. I've always had a joke that uh, by this, all men will know that you are evangelicals. 
when you find the most minute point of doctrine and beat each other up over it. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just unbelievable. It's like, it's like the one I've heard, you, you know, you're a Baptist. If the only way you know how to solve a problem is by forming a, forming a committee, you know, that, this is <laughs> <laughs> only way to solve a problem. You got to form a committee for that, right? <laughs> Either that or you're in the government. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well said. Well said. <laughs> True. Uh, Louis Burkhoff is another one that's well respected among among Calvinists, and uh, and he he quotes uh, Canis there, if that's the way you pronounce that, and he says it, it stands as an assured fact, a fact knowing no exceptions. Now that's a pretty strong statement, a fact knowing no exceptions and acknowledged by all well versed in the matter. In other words, people who are educated, people who actually read this stuff that all of the pre-Augustinian fathers taught that in the appropriation of salvation, there was a co-working of freedom and grace. In other words, Louis Burkhoff, a well-respected Calvinistic scholar who read the early church writings, he went and you would think that he's been, he's going to look for somebody who agrees with him. Obviously you're going to want to find somebody early that agrees with you. That's what Calvin did. That's what uh, Luther did. All of them are going to try to find the earliest church writings that agree with them. Um, and he did that and he didn't find it. Instead, what he concludes is, hey, it is absolutely undisputable that the early church fathers disagreed with Augustine on this point. And Augustine's the first one to really teach this monergistic uh, uh, aspect. He even goes on to admit, quote, they, the early church fathers, do not hold to an entire corruption of the human will and consequently adhere to a synergistic theory of regeneration, meaning a co-working of, you know, in other words, you have a response ability. You have the ability to respond to the the, the grace of God um, that that he he acknowledges. Uh, so too, Lorraine Bettner, uh, we, we've mentioned before, another, he's the one who popularized Tulip, by the way. He's the one who made the acrostic known in the 20th century. He wrote this, it may occasion some surprise to discover that the doctrine of predestination was not made a matter of special study until near the end of the fourth century. They, of course, taught, they, referring to the early church fathers, taught that the that salvation was through Christ, yet they assumed that man had full power to accept or reject the gospel, gasp and awe. Oh, my goodness. They actually believed men were able to accept or reject the gospel? <gasps> you know, just this, whoa, wow, that's such a novel concept, so um, crazy. Yeah, they would have denied the doctrine. Oh, go ahead. The, to the man. I mean, I, I pointed out in the book, everybody, just like yep. you said, I, I agree with Bettner. I, I agree with Burkhoff. I mean, I've got the books up here, uh, Systematic Theology. Uh, yeah, I agree with him. <laughs> and, and the reason I kind of feel like I have to keep reading these things is because I still see Calvinists just qu uh, quoting things out of context and trying to make it sound like you're the one who came up with this concept. Yeah. Burkhoff wrote this before you ever <laughs> went to Oxford. I mean, Bettner wrote this long before you ever stu started your studies. Um, this is not new. This is not something that's novel whatsoever. This is just 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 yeah. facts of the matter, despite what people like James White or others may be telling you on the internet. Um, you just go and read the sources for yourself. Uh, Herman Bavink. I, I don't know a more respected Calvinistic scholar than Herman Bavink. I mean, one of the most highly respected uh, among Calvinists. And he's he's fairly balanced too. He's he's not real extreme. He's he seems to be pretty level headed. Uh, he writes this: the early church fathers focused exclusively on the moral nature, freedom, and responsibility of humans, and taught that though humans had been born been more or less corrupted by sin, they remained free and were able to accept the proffered grace of God. The church's teaching did not include a doctrine of absolute predestination, in other words, Calvinistic predestination and irresistible grace. So again, do we agree yeah. with Babing? Yeah, we agree with what Babing says. That's that's exactly what what your 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 work is seeking to show. Not only is it seeking to show that, it's actually seeking to show when the transition took place and what were the possible motivations behind that transition, which right. I think is so it was so valuable for us to see the actual inner workings of Augustine's writings to see in order chronological order of when he was talking about libertarian free will early in his writings when it shifted to the non-free free will i.e. compatibilistic free will, that happened later when he began to to deal with Pelagius and others. Um, anything more you want to you comment on that in particular? No, I mean, I, I just, it's such, such an obvious point that uh, I'm not the first one uh, on any of this stuff. I just put it together and uh, I'm attacked like I'm the bad, bad boogeyman that's uh, trying to take down <laughs> Augustine and all of Christianity. Uh, no, <laughs> I'm just trying to 
to point out the truth uh, of what actually happened. And, and we needed a lot less heat and a little more light on the subject by, uh, by reading um, and, you know, thinking about what's being written. Well, it seems to me a, a more honest approach, uh, honest, maybe not the right word, but a, a more historically accurate approach, if you're going to try to defend deterministic logic, is the approach that I've seen more recently by Paul Ajima. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that name right. The ethics of the, I'll let you pronounce that for us. Um, uh, Tri Dr. Wilson, is that? Tripartite tractate. Yeah, that's from okay. the, the Nag Hammadi. Nag Hammadi. Okay. I don't even know what all that is. So that's why I have you here because you're, you're the scholar of the subject. And I know my, I know my place. You know, if you haven't noticed, I know my place. <laughs> so You're ahead of a lot of people writing these reviews. I tell you. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, basically it's a collection of Gnostics writings uh, found in Egypt and the sands there uh, at a library and uh, compiled, put together. And it gives us a pretty good idea of what the Gnostics themselves uh, said instead of just, uh, you know, polemical uh, actions by Christians against the Gnostics. So, so most scholars find it highly valuable to understand what were the Gnostics really teaching. Right. And uh, Paul Ajima's work, I'll read it off the back cover here. He re re refers to Valentinus, who was a known Gnostic of the time that was attacked quite uh, virtuously again by, by uh, the early church writers, if I, if I remember correctly. Yeah, Valentinus, Irenaeus. Has, and your Irenaeus came against him quite, uh, quite a lot. Uh, Valentinus has often been associated with determinism, which has been presented as, quote unquote, Gnostic, scare quotes, Gnostic, and then has not been taken seriously. It's been disregarded as an invention of ancient intra-Christian polemics. Lajima challenges this conception and presents insights into how early Christian determinism actually worked and how it effectually sustained viable and functioning ethics. In other words, what is Paul Lajima doing? He's saying, you know what? Christians were existed in Gnosticism, in determinism, and they were polemicized so badly that they were cast out as the heretics, but really we shouldn't do that. And so what is he doing? He's baptizing Valentinus. He's Valentining Manny. He's, he's baptizing Manny and the other Gnostics of the early church and trying to say these guys had actually a Christian root and they had good points to make and we shouldn't cast them out. We should actually see them as early Christians. To me, the reason I bring that up is obviously not because I agree with it by any means. I point that out because at least historically he's being accurate. He's not rewriting history. Uh, he's agreeing with what you're saying. Um, he's ultimately saying, yes, the only determinist in the first three, three, four centuries were Gnostics. But he's saying, yeah. and the Gnostics aren't as bad as we think they are. They're really actually Christians, and they got a bad rap. And we should actually look at their writings because their their ethics worked and their 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 doctrines worked. If you really understand them correctly, it seems to me that is a more historically accurate way for a determinist who lives today to try to go back and defend their history of tradition is to do what Paul Lajima is doing here. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of scholars who they are not friendly to Christianity. Uh, Elaine Pagels is very much into trying to bring Gnosticism into Christianity and, you know, Bart Ehrman, you know, those names. So, but Elaine, especially she had a, had a class um, when I was at Oxford, there was a student there who uh, said that the um, uh, class was of, called Faith Busters. I mean, she specifically tried to destroy the faith of anybody who believed in Christianity uh, in that class. And, and she was Jewish. She's not a Christian, uh, the head of her, a microbiology department. I mean, she's a sharp girl. And so, um, yeah, you, you've got these people that are trying to say, well, the Gnostics were part of Christianity. Well, um, if you read the early church fathers, maybe not really. I mean, if you believe them, uh, they were arguing against them, but there's still people who try to embrace it. And, and so this the scholars trying to say, well, maybe we should go ahead and bring them in and uh, show, yeah, determinism was part of Christianity. And, and that's a valid point. If you believe that Gnostics were Christians, which I don't, um, but if you believe that, it makes perfect sense to try to bring it in and say determinism has always been a part of Christianity because of these early Gnostics. Yeah, I think yeah. the reform yeah, Calvinists should use that argument and uh, try to try to join up with the Gnostics and uh, see if they can bring their determinism in at the earliest point, because that's the only way they're going to do it. 
Yeah, and 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 to be without being revisionists, I mean, it, just revising histor history, they have they have to admit what Burkhoff and Bettner and all these other scholars admit. Yeah, Augustine's the first one to really introduce these things, and um, and, and to argue, I think what what some of the the reviews argued. I think I remember reading one of the reviews who actually argued that well, maybe. Augustine was, as uh, Bettner describes him, the spirit-filled theologian of the West, and that God was using him to right the ship, so to speak, of the false doctrines of the early church by bringing back in determinism, by bringing back in this concept and idea of, of sovereignty as determinism, and, and uh, maybe Augustine was uh, progressively revealing something that just hadn't been really clearly made known in the church. How do you respond to, to people who say things like that? Well, it's certainly possible. I mean, that's not an unreasonable idea. You, you have to consider all ideas and say which one's the, mo the best one when you look at all the facts. Um, and so even though that could be true, when you look at how Augustine went about coming up with his theology, it becomes highly suspicious <laughs> that uh, he did not recover something that was lost, but that he actually invented something by bringing in his pagan ideas. That's the point of the book that you can't get from here to here by saying he just recovered something. He actually invented something that was never there previously. There's zero evidence for it. Yeah, well said. And I, I hope that people will hear this interview um, and, and consider thinking outside the echo chamber of maybe their, their, their normal people they always listen to, because I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be overly polemic in saying this, but it's just a fact of the matter that the leading, the leading voices, the guys with the stages right now, men like John MacArthur, for example, um, when when he represents Arminians, uh, he, he it's pretty much you're either a Calvinist or an Arminian. Of course, that's the dichotomy that most of them set up. You can't be anything yeah. in between. You have to be in one of those two camps, and he represents as Arminians just in the most grotesquely uh, inaccurate way that you, saying even that that Arminians believe you initiate your own salvation. I mean, that, that's an exact quote, I believe. I mean, things like that, which is so antithetical to what Arminius himself taught or any Arminian scholar that I'm aware of teaches. I, I don't know anybody on our side of the aisle of non-Calvinists who think that we initiate our own salvation. Yeah. Um, d just these kinds of things, that that's what the Calvinistic world of leadership, that's how they're representing the other side. If they're representing yeah. the other side in that, polemic type of fashion, um, then they can't be trusted, in my estimation, to be good scholars who are willing to engage with what we actually believe and teach. And that that should, if nothing else, at least lead the the good Bereans who are watching the show to say, I, I need, even if I disagree with Leighton, that's fine. If I disagree with Ken Wilson, fine. I'm at least going to be uh, objective enough not to make blatantly false claims against the other side of the aisle just because... Um, I, I happen to disagree with them over a theological point. You want to comment on that? I think that's right. I, I wrote a book. I, I never published it because I thought it would not go anywhere. But the, the title, you know, there's a book, Why I'm Not an Arminian. And then the response is, Why I'm Not a Calvinist. And so I wrote a book, Why I'm Neither a Calvinist nor an Arminian. Um, I'm, I'm not either one of them. Um, you know, maybe one of these days I'll throw it out. I don't have enough controversial stuff out there yet. So maybe I could get another one out and see if I could really stir the waters. Um, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> Go for it. I'll buy it. I'll buy it. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm looking forward to your next your next book. So I, I hope that you will. Well, one of the questions that I, I know is, is going to be asked and is continually being asked uh, regularly is what about the debate with James White? Whatever came of that? Because I know you made a public challenge to Dr. White. You asked me for a way of contacting him. And so I gave you his email address. I know you sent him a formal challenge to debate. Uh, and people have asked me and I said, hey, I am not I am not the mediator here. I do not want to be associated uh, with the, you know, in other words, I don't want to be, at, I don't want uh, Dr. Wilson's scholarship to be painted as you know, with me, I want him to stand on his own. I, I'm getting out of the middle of this. I gave them their, the phone numbers. I can contact each other. So yeah. I don't know the answer to that question. So I'll ask you for the public record. Is that going to happen? What's, what's, what's come of it? I have no idea. I mean, I, I actually uh, didn't want uh, uh, James White to have to buy my book. I, I sent him a personal copy. Um, well, the, yeah, the, the, 
he got it. He showed it on his show. Uh, we we went over some of his baloney that he tried to uh, argue. Uh, yeah, and so uh, I'll put a link in the I'll put a link in the show notes of our response to uh, James White's supposed review of your work. Um, and for those that didn't get to see that, because you systematically go through point by point um, all of of his claims and and I think thoroughly debunk them. Uh, on that program. So that was yeah. a year or two ago. It's been a while since yes. we had that, 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 that uh, concept, but I was still curious if there's ever going to be a, a public debate. Well, I mean, his, his ad, argue, ad hominem argument was, uh, it must be flossing his pet's teeth or something. I mean, I, I, I finished that and, uh, you know, COVID's <laughs> over. Uh, and so I'm happy to debate him at any point if he's still willing, but, uh, he's going to have to, uh, you know, get out of the, you know, blades of grass and start seeing the trees. They see the forest. Um, you know, what he's doing is, is so micro, you know, dissecting little stuff that he's missed the big point. And, you know, I yeah. think people are going to realize that if we debate, he, he's got some serious problems uh, with his theology, as do all Calvinists, because of what Augustine did. Now, I don't know if you've heard this, but I've, I've challenged Dr. White to come on the program with me or I'll go on his program, just have a discussion with him. And his response to me was to say, I'll debate you again, Leighton, but you have to debate the text that I've picked. You have to debate using the original language only, the New Testament. Um, and you can't use notes, which I told him, I don't even preach without notes. I'm too dumb not to have my notes. I have to have my notes. I don't, I don't do well without those. Um, nor can I pronounce Greek very well. I can read it and use it with my tools, but I, I'm not going to be, my hand's going to be tied behind my back uh, in order to debate you. So I've declined that offer um, so my, my, my suggestion maybe is, uh, that Dr. White debates you only using the original Latin of Augustine uh, without notes. Uh, I know you would be up for that. Do you think yeah. he would be up for that? Well, maybe we'll, we'll see. I mean, whatever he wants to do, I, we can, uh, can make that happen as long as it's fair. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Of course I couldn't help it. I couldn't help it, but. Um, no, I, I would love to see the debate. I'll even find a place here in, in Dallas to host it if if that, that's a problem. Um, I'm sure I, with Dallas Baptist University up the road, I've got some connections there. I've got several churches in the area that would be perfect venues for that, that I, I think would be glad to host it. Um, yeah. Texas Baptist has uh, a lot of connections with uh, perfect venues that would, I, I think, gladly host a, a, a discussion like that. So there's no excuse for why we wouldn't have a good discussion like that and have a good debate back and forth discussion. And so um, if, if uh, Dr. White happens to hear this, then he knows that we're still waiting. We'd love to to, to pull something like that together if, if uh, he would like to do that. So absolutely. Well, well, that like a great idea. So yeah, I, uh, a couple of things I, I probably should mention a couple of trans points that uh, yeah. are very interesting. Uh, as I read through all of those, um, you know, he's, I, I'm going to read a quote here on page 120. He wrote in De uh, baptismo, we find abundant proof of Augustine's persistent traditional free the theology. What was that proof? According to Wilson, Augustine, um, maybe then in 400 AD, held that salvation can occur without water baptism, as if he denied that after 411, which is false, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's real obvious because Augustine himself said that um, the thief on the cross was not water baptized, uh, and he had no problem with that until after 411. Um, Wilson used that to argue that John 3, 5 is not yet involved into a proof text. Uh, again, false, since the very reference Wilson referred to from Augustine's own Baptism 219 actually treated as John 3, 5 as baptismal rebirth text. Grammatical errors, um, but we won't get into that. The question is proof text for what? Well, he hasn't read the book. It's a proof text, again, as we mentioned, for salvation from Adam's inherited guilt that damns the infant. That's the proof text for his 3, 5. Other people use John 3, 5 um, as... Um, a, a baptismal uh, point, uh, not a proof text, but saying, yes, we, we can support infant baptism from this idea. Augustine was not the first, uh, but he was the first to use it as a proof text for that inherited guilt. And, and then I think he also got on to me for saying um, that uh, it, it was physical water, a physical birth, the water from the physical birth of the mother when the water breaks. And that was just novel and unprecedented. And um, I would point out to him that uh, you know, a few years back, a guy named John Calvin actually wrote that idea in his uh, section on John 3, commentaries on John 3, that it was a physical birth. So, I mean, the man needs to educate himself on uh, 
what's really happening instead of making these false accusations against me on uh, on what's happening. Um, let me see if I have uh, that quote from King. Uh, let, let me read another one here. Not only did, okay. not only origin again, the grammar is horrible. Not only origin did not remotely see Psalm fifty one five as hyperbolic, but saw them as proof texts that infants had sins in them at birth that required them to, to be forgiven uh, of as given in baptism. Um, he took the very view of Psalm fifty one five that Wilson accused Augustine of Manichaean and Gnostic novelty over. But you know. Read page 71 of my actual Oxford thesis. He, the man did not read the book. Uh, it, it doesn't say the mother, mother sacrifices for sin and purification after birth, but only it's similar to a guilty person sacrificing for sin. I discussed this whole thing and why Origen's um, uh, whole point on this and the one that people pull from Origen is pedo baptism is actually an interpolation. It goes against everything that Origen says and all the surrounding context. And somebody has placed, I mean, that's written in my book. I, I make that point. And uh, Danilou, who's uh, an expert on this in French, uh, wrote about this and says, this is pedo baptism is coming from the early apostolic fathers, just can't be supported. Um, I, there's just so much in here. I mean, I wish we had time just to go through every little thing and show that, that, uh, it's, it's just, he's not making sense because he's yeah. just pulling them up. Um, wow. How about, uh, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, I, I was just going to say, that's one of the reasons I didn't know that it even when we, we needed to even go through much, many of the quotes, because as I scroll through them, you're exactly right. They all deal with baptism and infants and baptism of infants, but none, none of them have anything to do with infants going to hell that aren't baptized or inheriting uh, something from Adam. I mean, none of those kind of conclusions are being drawn. Right. Uh, and, so and, I, I don't know. Yeah. Go ahead. So here, here's one. Contrary to what Wilson said, Jerome did side with Augustine on original sin. Jerome in his later years wrote in against the plague in book three. Uh, and he's talking about that. And if you object that some are spoken of who did not sin, you must understand that they did not sin in the same way as Adam did by transgressing God's command of paradise. But all men are held liable either on account of their ancient forefather Adam or on their own account. That's interesting. He that is an infant is released in baptism from the chain which bound his father. Uh, he who is old enough to have discernment is set free from the chain of his own or another sin by the blood of Christ. But where does it find inherited guilt unto damnation? And uh, Jerome does not agree with Augustine on that inherited damnation unto hell. Uh, and so you have to, again, take it in context. Um, right. I mean, I, I have yeah. a whole thing on on why the physical aspect of the physical birth of the mother and that being the water uh, and the spirit is superior. And, and I, I read the the explanations by people. Uh, who are for water baptism. And it's like, people, you, you really haven't understood that in the ancient literature, water was a common understanding of the birth uh, water of the mother. Uh, that's in Job. Uh, it's in other Old Testament texts. It's in Fourth Ezra. It's in intertestamental literature. I mean, you can find this stuff everywhere on um, the water, meaning a physical birth. So the water and the spirit could be an actual physical birth but yeah we, we just don't have time to <laughs> to go through it all go through every single yeah every single one of them um well and and the fact that there's so many scholars even on the reform side the more calvinistic side of the aisle who would even side with you on that point would would i would think that they would be uh more in line with you and wanting to defend that the earliest church fathers uh, had their understanding of of baptism correct, and that that it's not salvific in the sense of saving somebody from going to hell, um, it, it just seems to me to be a, a, a much uh, more obvious reading of the text, as well as the the writers who were writing about the text uh, in the earliest church uh, yeah. writings. But what's uh, interesting but is I the want, Catholics yeah. pick that up, and you know they want to they want to obviously want to support this salvific aspect of infant baptism and reception of the Holy Spirit. Uh, type thing from Augustine, which is from their origin of it, but they don't hold to his uh, double predestination, his micro, micro uh, managing dictatorial God, uh, that stoic type of God. They, they don't actually embrace a lot of other things that Augustine taught. Um, specifically, I mean, trans 
starts making this comment about, you know, fathers such as uh, uh, Victorinus, Jerome and Chrysostom uh, saw faith as a gift of God. Well, that, again, that's a very typical amateur mistake because my sp book specifically in, in the larger thesis talks about all these guys and how they saw faith as a gift, not that God infused faith into a person to regenerate and cause him to believe, but that faith was the gift by which God would produce salvation. Um, that's on 208 and 209, if, if anybody wants to read it. But, you know, Tran just, just doesn't read my book. He, he just makes statements that are, are untrue and uh, actually libel. I, <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, I mean, if, if he's not careful, he's going to get sued for libel, for diminishing scholarly reputation. Uh, I'd suggest he, he might want to take that uh, book review off, which is not a book review. Um, that that's a serious matter. Yeah, when 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 you're when you, when you're dealing at the scholarly level, there's a certain uh, demand for ex, there's expectations that you have when you're saying, okay, if this this person's re, this book has been scholarly reviewed, peer reviewed, and published in a journal place of of that's considered a, a scholar place of scholarship, that doesn't necessarily make it always right. It doesn't necessarily make it always. Uh, uh, perfect and by any stretch of the imagination, but at least it's, it's, it's been weeded out of from just the, the polemical claims and the misstatements and those kinds of things. Those things are usually weeded out whenever they're, pu they're published in journals like that. And so my challenge to Tran or others who may want to bring a serious challenge is do your homework and then write a scholarly uh, piece and present it for peer review at, yeah. to one of the journals. Anybody can do yeah. that. Now, obviously they usually demand that you have some, uh, some evidence of education in the subject, but, uh, uh, go figure, but <laughs> sorry, I'm not, I'm trying not to be mean here, Dr. Wilson. I really am. Um, but, but at the same time, but, but at the same time, even those who have the educational credentials and the pedigree in order to publish in journals like that, you and I both know that this kind of work would not even be considered. It would be laughed off the page because they're that's not right. doing basics to get there. Um, and that, that's, that's what we're trying to point out here is that you've got to, you've got to be willing to go a little deeper uh, and, and look at the, the best of the best um, uh, work that's being offered. And, and, and that's where I come back to the major point that we were just discussing with regard to Augustine departing from where the church had been and what was orthodox within Christian tradition. And people say, well, who cares? Scripture is our, is our authority. Well, we all agree. Dr. Wilson agrees Scripture is our authority. But whenever Calvinists repeatedly reference tradition and reference the, the having you know, tradition on their side over and over and over again, then we have every right as non-Calvinists to simply go back to the history and go back and look at what the earliest church writings actually taught, what Augustine actually did, and why he might have actually done it. Because if you're going to make the argument, as some people do, that Augustine was being used by God to introduce or to you know progressively reveal this truth that had been um, kind of lost within the church, then you probably should know your stuff. You should study. And if you can see what I think Ken Wilson's book points out, the obvious change in his way of thinking and the motivations behind that 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 reasons for doing this, um, it becomes really obvious. This isn't a spirit led yeah. process. <laughs> it's, yeah. it, it's, it, it's so obviously not spirit led. And the reason I say that so dogmatically is because I, and I'm not, again, I'm not trying to be overly mean to, to, to Augustine himself, but when you compare Augustine's, just his moral life, the way he lived compared to, Pelagius and many of the other well-respected early church fathers, Augustine, I think, would be the first to admit he had some major problems, <laughs> some moral morality issues, and some other things he was really struggling with and dealing with. And again, I'm not trying to demean him. I mean, people can go through all kinds. I have my own moral issues. We all have our own struggles that we go through. So I'm not trying to say he can't be used of God because he has moral issues. But when we're trying to discern whether somebody's being led by the Spirit and and God's using them in, a, in such a way as to guide the church from this, a lot of times you will know them by their fruit. Um, and when you look at the life of people like Pelagius, who even Augustine called godly man, 
Yeah. A very godly man. Yeah, aesthetic. Um, yeah. yeah. And I'm not saying he's perfect either by any means. I'm not trying to say any of them are perfect. But when you're when you're looking at things like this, when you look back at the Reformation time, for example, and you see people like Luther and Zwingli and Calvin killing people for disbelief for not believing or heretics for being heretics. And then you got the Anabaptist over here and people like Balthazar Hubmeyer saying, guys, we don't need to try to win people over with sword and fire. We need to have patience and prayer because God's patient with us. He, he, he sent Jesus to die for the sins of the whole world. We should be patient with them. We should let them live as long as possible so that they'll have chance to repent. And he's making that argument based upon his free will soteriology that, that, that we can convince them. We can persuade them. Don't try to burn them at the stake or kill them if they disagree with you. And, and you're saying this guy was marked by Christian um, a, a Christian example. He wasn't just, quote, unquote, a man of his time, just doing what the Catholic Church had kind of taught him to do and just kill everybody that disagrees with you. No, he was actually standing against the ills of the Catholic Church long before even Luther was. That's right. And he was, and he was saying that we should baptize uh, believers, not infants. And he got actually, under the rule of Zwingli, got burned at the stake for believing in, in believers' baptism, of, of all things. And, and the reason I point that out is just to say, when you're trying to, to discern where is the, the line of Christian thought? Don't always go with the one who won the battle because they killed everybody who disagreed with them and burned all their books at the stake. Yeah. Look for the, the still small voice. Look for that little quiet person that's being persecuted in the corner because usually they're the ones that are holding the truth. And so oftentimes I think our history is marked by the bullies of Christian think throughout history who have just kind of railroaded some of their beliefs and some of their ways of thinking yeah. so much so that they've they've made it sound like this is just overwhelmingly what every scholar has always believed since the beginning of time. Yeah. And, and 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 I think men like you are so valuable in the church to say, time out, guys. Um, let's go back and actually look at what happened in history. And so thank you for that work. I think it's so valuable for us to understand that. So what encouragement would you give, uh, I guess, as we close here, to our listeners who may be introduced to this topic for the first time, maybe are, are still maybe on the fence, maybe like the, the brother who wrote me, just kind of still working through all of this, being challenged for the first time to maybe think, well, maybe th some of the things I've been taught aren't exactly right. What what encouragement would you give to them? Well, the, the opening to my book um, just said, it's written for people who value truth over tradition. Um, we can get stuck in our own thought and our own tradition. And I personally like to be around people of all different faiths, all different persuasions within Christianity and, and rub shoulders and mix with them because it forces me to look at my own theology and say, am I really where I should be? Am I missing something? And if, we're, if we ever get to the point where we're not asking, am I missing something? We're missing something. <laughs> we're missing the big yeah. picture. And so I would encourage him to do that. And for those, I, I know your, your reader was concerned about Tran and, and his deal. And I just want to read the last sentence that he wrote on that. Um, Wilson, yeah. uh, Wilson's dissertation was thoroughly dishonest and written as a smear piece, not only against Augustine, but all who don't fit his age, account of, uh, age of accountability, free will, Baptist views. Um, th that's libel. That's that's <laughs> that's illegal. Uh, that could get him sued um, because I never discussed an age of accountability in that book, either book. Uh, I'm not a free will Baptist. Um, and, and some of my theology would not fit, wouldn't line up with the usual free will Baptist views. So, you know, when you see a source like that, it ought to make you say, hmm, who, who might be right? The one who's so, you know, ferociously attacking or somebody who can be calm and say, here are the facts. Show me your facts. And um, you better dig a little deeper if you're trying to quote the early church fathers because you don't know what you're doing. Um, you're, you don't have any education, and it's easy to misunderstand them when you take this little snippet right here and don't read the entire work to find out what the person is really saying. And that's what's required in patristics. You have to read the whole thing. Yeah, well said. And I, I think that's a, a good encouragement is pretty much what was said next. Be good Bereans. Uh, go yeah. and do the research for yourself. And, and no, not all of you can be Oxford scholars that uh, learn the original languages. Um, and, and that's why we think men like Ken Wilson that God is using to help uh, do some of that research for us. But that doesn't mean that you can't go and, and read the, the best of the best scholars on, on both sides of the aisle to really look and see what's what's being said 
and and understand it um, objectively, and and then then I think you're you're qualified uh, to begin to evaluate which side is is being more true to history, um, being more accurate with their representation of how things uh, have developed, um, and I, I am not nor is Dr. Wilson saying that everyone who has believed in a free will theology has been perfect and has just never done anything wrong and that we've never burned heretics. And I'm not trying to say that we've, we have, we have people on our side of the aisle who've done really bad things too. Um, that that's not at all what we're trying to tr trying to argue. What we're, we're trying to say, I think is that when we really look at the whole of history and you look at how things have developed, there's a lot less support for the more deterministic slash Calvinistic way of reading the scriptures than what is being painted right now online, especially with the overwhelming resurgence of Calvinistic thought among among many of the, the leading scholars and the leading pastors that are, are being popularized today. Right. And, and one of the reasons I started this program, and, and I think one of the reasons that, that Dr. Wilson produced the, the book that he produced, The Foundation of Augustinian Calvinism, is that people can begin to see the other side um, from, from a hopefully objective and scholarly position to say there is there's more to be seen if you're willing to go beyond the surface level popular level um, argumentation that's being uh, produced out there on the stages and on online and so dr wilson thank you so much for your time today thank you so much for uh, producing this work and uh and and i can't wait for your next book i hopefully that will be soon and possibly debates if, if there's a debate coming up i'd love to see a debate that would be fun too yeah, I, I would like to do so too. And I would hope that some of the actual reform scholars would uh, pick this up and start uh, commenting on it. I, I've not seen a reform scholar comment on it. Um, so maybe they don't even know about it yet. I'm not sure, but uh, love yeah, to so talk that, about that, it. That actually answers the question some may ask is, why aren't you dealing with a serious review versus Tran and, and these Amazon yeah, reviews? Well, right. because the serious the serious re reviews aren't out there. There's no, there's yeah. no, there's no PhD uh, out there that's willing to touch this yet. And, and yeah. that's, not, that's not to try to say that they can't touch it. I have no idea if they can touch it or not, but here's your challenge. You know, we're kind of putting the line in sand. We're, right. we're, we're willing to, to, to hear it. And we're, I'll have Ken Wilson back on as soon as somebody publishes a peer reviewed scholarly journal against Ken Wilson's work. I'll have you back on and we can respond to it. We, we'd be glad to do that. So that yeah, I'd, I'd love that opportunity. You know, I'd like to see what they have to say. Well, that's a date. Well, that's we'll, we'll do that as soon as it happens. And uh, if the if the debate with James White doesn't happen first, then maybe we'll have you on again uh, to to uh, to discuss whatever review does come out that actually has some scholarly uh, review behind it. So, anyway, as always, let me remind you: go now, share Christ, and show love. God bless. Goodbye. <laughs>